microphone line? Do I even need a microphone? No, it's a cozy, uh, cozy. The online. So hello everyone. Uh, it's great to be here and great to be a member of, of Rocket community. So uh, I'm very happy to contribute a little bit. And today I'll be speaking about, about uh, the importance of strategic thinking when you want to develop something new. Uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, ways how you uh, can understand what innovation is. And, uh, but basically, if you want to create something new, uh, there are a lot of important elements. And I'll be speaking about the most important. How, uh, what are the most important elements in the area of inspiration, in the area of focus, uh, what methodology you can use and which uh, concepts you should avoid if you want to create something new. And I'll share uh, my personal uh, examples from my previous life when I used to be a, a Minister of Finance and how you can implement uh, innovative strategies in very challenging public service environment and also uh, I'll introduce you uh, to our own uh, strategic thinking model uh, which is uh, uh, quite helpful because we use it when we consult uh, companies on uh, shaping this strategy, reviewing this strategy uh, and uh, of course in execution of it. So let me start with uh, the best symbol of, uh, of strategy uh, which you can imagine. Do you know what it is? Those who participated in uh, a Christmas party of Rocket should know. It is gyroscope. And uh, uh, when this wheel is spinning, it, it has anti-gravitational anti effect. Uh, once you spin it, it uh, preserves, preserves the direction, no matter what turbulences you can face. And this is why uh, it, is a, it is so important symbol, because uh, that little detail is used in, in spacecrafts, in, 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 in planes, in ships, in order to preserve uh, the, the direction you want, no matter how the environment is changing. So this is why uh, gyroscope is, is so important. So, but when we talk about this strategy, so yes, inspiration is important, uh, focus is important, where you put your resources, where you 
you pay, pay your attention because it is a scarce um, feature as well. It is very important how you create a joint will of, of your colleagues in order to achieve something, how you measure your success. And there is a fourth element which is the most important but I'll disclose it at the end of, of my presentation. So just to keep you awake. So the picture is not very clear. Why? Because even if you know all or most, most of all of different concepts, either SWOT analysis, pastel analysis, five forces analysis, or the winners, qualifiers, operational excellence. You can know them, you can be good at them, but there is no clarity on how to use them if you want to create something new. Because if you follow a traditional path, of course you can find something, you can find your way, yeah, you can uh, create, value, you can be competitive. But if you want to discover something new, you should avoid all those traditional pathways because uh, everybody else are using them. So basically you'll be just one among many others. So in this respect, uh, I like so much uh, the paradox of wine shopping. You know, there is a famous scientist, uh, Neil deGrasse uh, Tyson, who is an uh, astrophysicist, and he uses this paradox. And he tells, if when I go shopping for a bottle of wine, uh, usually a sa salesperson asks me a question, how can I help you to find what you're looking for? And his answer is always, if you help me to find what I am looking for, I won't discover what I am not looking for. And that's a deep, a deep answer to the question, what is innovation? If you follow the same path as others, it's very difficult to find something new. So we developed uh, at Insynergy 4, uh, together with my colleague, uh, we develop, developed uh, a model of strategic thinking when you want to find something, to discover something new, uh, seek for inspiration and uh, uh, want to distinguish areas where you should focus in order to make your strategy uh, anti-gravitational. Uh, because there are so many uh, gravitational forces different stakeholder expectations, changing uh, regulatory environment, economic environment. So uh, there are always problems with motivation and, and things like that. So in order to overcome those obstacles, of course, first of all, if you want to uh, come up with a good idea, you, you should seek for inspiration. Inspiration comes from four elements from the past, from uncertainty of the present day, from future envisaged future tendencies, or from the very different expectations of, of stakeholders. Because stakeholders can have very different approaches for tendencies which started in the past. The approach to uncertainty can be very different and their approach uh, towards uh, the future is also very different. So basically inspiration can be anything, not only just five forces or, or uh, strengths, weaknesses and things like that. So inspiration can be anything, but you should follow a certain path in order to, in order to find what can inspire you. And for each of you, the source of inspiration will be different. But usually it is, it is not internal thing, it is external when you analyze the environment or market where you want to operate. When we talk about the focus, 
there are also uh, many areas where you can focus, but uh, without a focus, uh, your strategy uh, won't be successful, and you need to focus in order to develop your uh, competitive edge. So without further ado, I'll give uh, just a few examples, as, as I mentioned from uh, my previous slide, focusing on what was the inspiration, uh, what was the main idea, how, how uh, we selected the focus, how the joint will was created, and at the end of presentation, the main element will be disclosed. So, um, first strategy, uh, which all of you are very connected to, is about We were inspired by the past. So by the past, uh, our government, uh, almost more than 10 years ago, Kubilu's government, and they started inviting shared services centers. So, so the strategy was how to build a market uh, basically from scratch, and they were successful. So why it inspired me that Sooner or later, so my, my thought experiment was the following. Sooner or later, people working in shared services center will be tired of being just small details in the whole system. They, uh, uh, they would seek uh, to create something new. And we uh, focused on partnerships and why partnerships we decided that we need to create fintech uh, sector almost from scratch. And this is how stick strategy was shaped. And stick strategy, it is easy to start, easy to technovate, easy to invest, and easy to grow. And all the initiatives were evaluated uh, according to, according to uh, stick strategy. And this is my colleague Verminta, who is here. <laughs> and why partnerships? We decided that uh, without, without a great partnership, it's very difficult to create. Because you have regulator, you have supervisor, you have infrastructure, you have uh, old market players, new market players. And our focus was to make those bridges here. Uh, internally in Lith Lithuania and with people abroad. And we participated almost in all mm, conferences uh, worldwide in order to invite people and make connections here. And it was quite successful since this area is open. <laughs> the, next, the next strategy was about, was inspire, inspired uh, by the future, and future is green, future is renewable energy, and uh, so this project or the strategy uh, is worth uh, 500 million. Can you guess what it is? The focus was stakeholders. We were thinking about the uh, investments into renewable energy, green future, and uh, Lithuanian in energetic independence. Who can be against Lithuanian energy independence? And it was Ignitis IPO, which now allows for Ignitis to invest, a f to leverage attracted capital and invest a few billion of euros into renewable energy. And stakeholders, I don't know how many discussions I had with almost all politicians, uh, because privatization or, or the idea of semi-privatization, attracting capital and diluting uh, a part of the capital of state-owned company uh, previously was a nightmare, but it was successful. The next project uh, was related to uh, COVID pandemic, and uh, it, was, it was a 
um, tough time for everybody. And one weekend uh, when we already learned that uh, in a couple of days we are going to have the first case of COVID in Lithuania, and of course, uh, uh, lockdown, we knew that lockdown, it's just a matter of a couple of days. Uh, we decided that we, there are so many expectations from the society, from, uh, from businesses, and it was about the present, about the nightmare related with the future, and with the nightmare uh, with previous financial crisis. So there, are, there were so many different expectations. So I invited my colleagues and we gathered, gathered uh, that weekend and we shaped a five billion strategy. How to cope with the, how to cope with the um, effects uh, on, on our economic situation. And we decided that uh, our strategy will be value-driven. And that strategy we called RSVP, Responsible Player. Why Responsible Player? Uh, it is the abbreviation of uh, Lithuanian uh, words. So if you translate into English, it's that the main values were you should be determined, uh, solidarity, effectivity, and meaningfulness. So horizontal values uh, in terms of which we are going to evaluate, evaluate any kind of ideas. So the, um, the value of that strategy was 5 billion, and it was successful if we compare to other countries. Uh, responsible player means that we are not we do not know exactly how we are going to achieve this. There, there was no time to, uh, for consultations and, and things like that. We just decided that, look, the values are the following, areas are the following, uh, we're going to help to, for um, businesses, citizens, and uh, deal with the uh, overall liquidity and, and borrowing. And the result is zero, but in this case, zero was uh, a very great uh, result comparing to uh, a downturn of around 6% at EU area. At the same time, uh, we were inspired by a very deep idea of what a virus is. Our DNA is, uh, uh, consists not only from uh, uh, genuine genes of a human being, but in, uh, in the course of evolutionary processes, we had plenty of parts of viruses, old pandemics. Some of them is just rubbish material of DNA, some of that stuff is used for our functions, and some, vi some viruses are, are just sleeping in us. And so the idea was we should use this pandemic in order to make a jump in our uh, Lithuanian economy development towards higher value added economy. Uh, at that time, uh, so all the logistics and the value chains uh, were disrupted. Uh, the uh, independence of euro production, that idea was raised. So we decided that if we invest into certain areas, we can attract a lot of new companies, new investments from China and other production areas if we focus on innovation areas. So this is how we can grow very fast. And uh, we focused on engagement of uh, the smartest people in, in public service. And they developed the plan. The plan was adopted. But what happened? Uh, 2.2 billion plan. So uh, 
it was supposed that in a couple of years uh, we can invest uh, such an amount of money. And so Lithuania would be just like a Singapore or something like that. So that was the idea. But a new government uh, came, and uh, so the amount of uh, possible investments uh, was preserved. So not new DNA, but new generation Lithuania. And it's nothing wrong. So the new government decided that, okay, we should broaden the scope and not only invest into those innovative areas, but we should devote sufficient resources to, to healthcare, to uh, social initiatives, and, and things like that. And of course, in order to review that plan and change the name, they should challenge uh, those ideas which were generated by all those smart people from public service. And up till now, this plan, you cannot say that it is working. It's not a bad plan, but it's not working. So the, uh, the main answer is in uh, this fourth element, which keeps that wheel spinning. So idea, focus, joint will, and what is the fourth element? the most important one. What's the most important question you should ask yourself? And if you do not have a clear answer, so your strategy will fail. Of course, later on, you, you can blame that uh, the strategy and the idea was great, but the execution was very bad. So this fourth element is that the most important question to ask is who you are, who you want to be, for whom, how, and why. So if you cannot answer the question why, you won't create this meaningfulness which you require in order to make your strategy self-fulfilling. So, listen to this wise man, Carl Gustav Jung, that if you find a meaning thing, just follow it. And everything else is just details. Thank you. Thank you, Vilus. Uh, I'll take this, the clicker. <laughs> My name is Donatas. Uh, I'm also part of uh, Rocket's team. Uh, uh, I'll be moderating the panel discussion uh, after the presentations. And I'm taking over and I'll be uh, an MC for the rest of uh, the time. So next on the stage, I would like to invite Anders Norlin, our dear guest, uh, who is the head of Nordics and Baltics at Tenity. Anders, I am sure you have so many interesting and important things to share with us. I really hope Please. so. <laughs> so uh, thank you for having me. This is the fifth time I'm Vilnius, I think. I was here to talk to someone. The first trip I did to Vilnius was actually my last trip I did before COVID hit. We had a delegation from Sweden on FinTech with Business Sweden. Eight FinTechs. Four had not the courage to come because of COVID. Four joined and I joined here. Since then I've been in contact with them with the excellent um, um, rocket team. So, Russia, where are you? Here. So I have a tendency to walk away. I have the microphone like this, so please uh, give me some hints. And then on time. I totally lose time. Uh, uh, so please wave when it's, it's coming um, yeah, too long. So I have a massive amount of slides to go through. But I'll do it very quickly. So short of me, Anders, I'm based in Stockholm. Uh, I work for a company called Tenity. I will go through that a uh, bit on unlocking uh, collaboration between startups and co uh, corporates. That's our service. That's how I get paid, essentially. So we're doing, hopefully, some good things for big corporates in the financial industry. That's our core business. So this is the points I'll go through. A bit of Tenity, short. 
Open Invasion, I didn't join live, but I've seen the recording from the last session you had on Open Invasion, so I will not go through that, but just tap into what you said, Lena, and other speakers on that event. Also, our approach on that, the process we work with corporates in that space, some consideration uh, for both startups and, and um, corporates uh, to trying to avoid failures. Failures in, per se is not bad, actually, but uh, there's some considerations. And then one or two case stories, just quickly, uh, how it can turn up. So Tenity is uh, born in uh, Zurich as a spin-off from the Swiss stock exchange. So they had a massive innovation lab and they started to question what's the output of this with all the money and all the people involved. Usually those innovation labs uh, tend to be more corporate than the startup environment they should foster. So our uh, CEO today, Andreas, took it out as a separate entity and since then we've been delivering the innovation as a service to corpus, primarily in the, in the uh, financial industry. Uh, since then, uh, we have a hub in Singapore since four years. Uh, I'm the first person in the Nordic Baltics because there was a blank sheet for uh, Tenity. They had no clue what's happening, but they had a lot of questions from the corporate partners, what's happening, and probably also, uh, one of the most exciting areas of fintechs, actually the Nordic and the Baltics. So that's why they recruited me uh, since almost two years. Now I have two colleagues. Uh, we're recruiting gradually to step up the entire team to be based in the Baltics and the Nordics. Also, we have presence in UK and Turkey. We just acquired a company called Headquarters. They primarily do branded programs. They work a lot with Visa, Baker McKinsey, that type of big corporates. Um, most of the partners, some of them are very known. UBS, I think most people know about. Super launch bank, massive, takes time to work with them, but we do. Uh, Visa, of course, and the Ripple is also a client of ours, worth to mention. Um, some findings, very short, I don't think it's new, but we're trying to condense it. Actually, startups do drive innovation. Sometimes corporates maybe not really accept that or see that but actually do, either directly or indirectly influenced by people working in startup space. And it's always a challenge for big corporate. The larger you get, the more ad, uh, less agile, I would say, uh, an organization becomes. So it's difficult to maneuver. So how do you then operate in that environment? So what we see is the matching between corporate startups is the key, really. Uh, and everything goes faster and faster and faster, you know that, uh, so it comes it becomes more and more important. I think you had it, Lena, in your presentation. It's not if you should do it, you have to. The question is more how you should do it. Um, some conclusions, yeah, keep the position, you have to be innovative, et cetera, et cetera, and the speed goes massively, increasingly faster all the time. So this is the, our core message. So what we do is actually to work, introduce startups to the corporate world. Um, and we believe that's the really the route forward for, for any type of development in the, in, the, in the industry. This is our service, let's say, playbook. I will focus on the corporate innovation programs. We do a lot of event stuff, you know, the meet and greet uh, activities. We also do investments. We have an incubation fund. We run incubation programs. We invest in really early stage uh, fintechs. We have about 350 startups in our portfolio at the moment. We also do VC as a service, taking care of the whole investment engine for a CVC, a corporate VC. We can handle that as well. Um, yeah, why to work with us? Where well, we focus on the financial industry, more or less only. Um, been born from that environment. So we understand if we meet startups, we understand the complexity for those to actually uh, establish their business and do business. It takes time, very complex environment. So we are like born in that environment. So if we have startups in, a, in our programs, there's no rush. Yes, you have to move forward, but we know it also uh, takes a lot of time to get into um, uh, clients, corporates, especially in the financial industry. Open innovation, yes, uh, you can also define it. The mix inbound, outbound, inbound is that what we do. 
meaning you take uh, uh, startups with innovative ideas, the solution integrate into an existing structure. Nothing about that. Uh, I do this with my startups. I'm an angel investor, or used to be at least. Uh, you go from a problem, you find a solution, and you make money. That's innovation in a nutshell, to make it very simplified. If you don't make money, good idea, but not innovation. Um, theoretically, the McKinsey model you've seen, it started to be questioned because the time frame, you don't have time, so you, you have to do everything at once, more or less. So uh, you maintain what you have, you nurture, add on, or you develop completely new. I think you touched that subject. Um, HBR, Harvard Business Review, have this uh, matrix. It's more the products and how you enter different mar markets. So if you combine that, um, and you're trying to scope where we are. Um, we don't touch the core innovation. Uh, I think that's more what you talked about, strategy long term. Uh, in Sweden, we have banks stepping up from cobalt, uh, uh, investing billions, and we have another bank migrating everything to the cloud infrastructure, so we don't touch that, of course. It's more the adding on features. Instead of doing it in-house, why not figure out startups that can actually complement our business? The pros on that, this is the innovation funnel, pretty classic. What it's all about, you bring outside ideas and you pass it through a funnel, hopefully you have something popping up, popping out on the other end. Either as a service for your clients or for your internal processes. So the customer can be internally. You want to be more efficient internally, more cost efficient, quicker, faster, whatever. We usually put this in four steps when we work with startups. This is what we sit down with the corporates in workshops, go through the discovery, what's on the agenda. So hopefully they have the strategy in place. Otherwise it's a lot of work to align with the strategy. Then we explore what's out there. We evaluate and see how it fits into the corporate, and hopefully we have something that could be introduced either as a service to the clients or, again, internally. That's how the process, those steps. And we have different levels, so the partner acceleration, which may be the key area in this, in this uh, forum. Uh, we do a, a extensive workshops. We do the dedicated scouting. We have a team doing nothing else than scouting startups, scale-ups, globally. Nothing else, all the time. We have five people, that's a day job. We do that through database we have. We have the network, like Rocket is one component of that, of course. Uh, other organizations on top of startup communities. And then you have service providers that somehow can detect early stage startups anywhere. And we do direct contact with startups and scale-ups. Listen, we have this project going on with UBS or another big bank or insurance company? Is this something you would like to be introduced to or not? We do a proper analysis because it needs to be fit. The size is not the matter, but the, fit, uh, the fit, I will come to that, different topics that need to be a fit towards a corporate. And then eventually could up to a pilot or proof of concept. Not always, but uh, if so, they need some guidance how to run it. So you don't lose the temper, especially from startups. Uh, I just want to bring that it was a startup, a pretty new one. They want to do this revolutionary uh, international transfer money solution, sending the proposal to the bank. After two days, I was frustrated. They don't answer me. So, well, good luck. If they answer you in two months, you should be happy. So that's a cut, uh, culture gap sometimes. Very simplified, you have the bundle of startups and scale-ups globally. Here you have a corporate. We are the, the, the player in between to, to sort it. So in terms of wines, I guess uh, we wanted to take the best champagne and Bordeaux and whatever brand um, and uh, introduce it to the, the, to the corporate. Um, I realize it's more fertility, but it's actually sometimes Sometimes uh, it ends up you only meet and greet. It's good enough. You learn. 
for a startup to meet a really big bank, it's a massive learning. And for a bank or insurance company to meet a startup with some wild ideas, it's a learning. So it's good, it's a, it's a value. Sometimes they add on the business or even integrate to the, the, their uh, existing uh, offerings. So it varies. Sometimes it's a PUC as a target, but maybe just a meet and greet. Yes, we know each other. Maybe an opportunity in the future. Yes, I think we've gone through this. Um, legacy, of course, uh, banks. Um, I think in the Nordics and the Baltics, it's pretty well positioned, but some banks further south have massive problems. Uh, only in Germany, I think there's 4,000 banks. Most of them don't have that updated systems. Uh, for them to really collaborate with the startup is technically pretty difficult. The capacity, you have to have people on board to handle it, of course. Uh, the ability um, to find. Again, maybe you know the startup ecosystem in your city or in best case in your country. But what's happening in the rest of the world is very difficult. They're not really uh, equipped to do that. And then, of course, the speed. Two years ago, no one, yeah, AI was a topic, and then bam, something happens, and you have to adopt it super fast. And in less than two years, it's a massive change. And for a big corporate, obviously, it's a big challenge. Picture from here. <laughs> so you have to some of the big, uh, great pictures we had. We had a um, week of, uh, of our programs here exactly a year ago. So, so this is Chris from the UK in the, in the program. Um, very simplified, super simplified, the, the, the process of a POC from the first contact into market. Looks simple, but it's yeah, massive amount of work to get it done. And the most work is, is here in the beginning phase to align the expectations, stuff like that. I will come into that a bit later on. And again, with startups or even scale ups, they, have, they don't really understand that complexity. Some fintechs are born with people from the banks, of course, but usually not. So for them, it's like a shock to get in this massive corporate uh, structure. Um, and also what is expected in the end. Also a big uh, trouble point. You, you're aiming for something really big and then finally maybe it doesn't work out that well. Um, some areas, uh, strategy we talked about or you talked about a lot, um, has to be in place. Not short term, but long term. Uh, so there's a lot of questions we go through. This is very simplified. I mean, in Switzerland, they love slides. And they love slides with massive amount of information. So I've taken out about 80% of all the text and stuff, so, so you can grasp it. But uh, we are super professionals in doing very content-heavy slides in Switzerland. So. But this is some of the, uh, uh, the, the questions. Um, the willingness. Sometimes you hear the phrase of the innovation theater. You do a lot of stuff because it looks good, and we can publish it, and we can market it. We're doing a lot of activities with, with, um, with um, startups. Then what the startup should do is it check the experience from the bank and who is actually working with it for real, not just uh, showcasing stuff. For startup, you have to be very careful about the target. I mean, you have the ambition to be here, and now they meet the corporate or potential business here. Is that really good for them? It sounds good. I have this brand, I'm working it, but they're going to be drained in a massive amount of work. So it looks good from first sight, but it could be disaster because you're going to be so much allocating your time for one product with one bank or one big corporate. In the end, that's not your really focus area or your big business opportunity. So this meet and greet, I think, is super important. Um, the structure, startups, scale-ups, not always have that great structure, to be honest. They're very agile, they should be. So they have to understand the complexity from a big organization. Big organizations, they do routine jobs. Startup jobs don't do routines. They do business or exploration. So. Culture and people may be the number one factor. Everything is perfect. 
on paper, documents, but the end goes shit anyway because we don't like each other. You say that, I think that. You say potato, I say tomato. So that's really in a nutshell. You really need to, it's like getting married. You don't get married directly, you want to get engaged first. So I think that's super important. You really like to be involved. It's not the business itself only, it's the setup. Processes, yes. I will not go through that because then I am going to be stuck, but it's, it needs to be structured. From a core perspective, it has to be structured. You need to have KPIs. What are the KPIs we're actually going to measure to? And we've done some simple stuff. Number of startups, number of ideas, speed of the uh, product, stuff like that. So if you put that together, again, this is simplified. So there's a lot of experience in different type of products we're trying to really go through before we do a product with a corporate. Messy. Very simplified. So from the starter strategy, we have different type of goals from the beginning. A starter wants to do business, bam, the, 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 the corporate just want to have, figure out if this is a solution that they can implement in two, three, four, five years maybe. And the expectations can be very, very different. The people behind, you have persons but without the decision power. So they say things, but in the end, the decision will be different because it's not anchored uh, within the organization. Um, yeah, the execution of the product, people come and go. Maybe it's a bit isolated or there's a team here somewhere they're doing stuff, but it's not anchored uh, to the rest of the organization. So everything works fine and everything's ready, and then yes, and then no one is accepting it in the rest of the organization. So you have to make sure that is aligned. And then shit happens, of course. All of a sudden, a disaster, uh, different priorities. We don't care about this project. Out you go, because we need to allocate resources for this. Our stock market is going down, or our CEO said something really bad or whatever happens and all of a sudden no one do, does anything from a corporate side. The same thing from a startup uh, or scale up. Uh, if they do perfect delivery on the plan, probably not that often. Stuff happens. People, people are leaving, new people come in, they don't understand or the key persons are you know, doing something else all of a sudden. Um, so if you have to boil it down, this is the three. I don't think it's that new, but if you really figure it out, you need to figure out. You have to really figure out those elements. How about timing? We are almost out, but... Uh... Okay, I'm good. I'm thinking uh, just two... Yes, yes. Uh, two cases, I will not go into detail, it's um, uh, problematic because we have cases, they don't want to reveal it, neither from a corporate or from a startup, yes, startup always want to brag, but uh, so quite often they don't want to reveal anything about it. And of course all the cases that doesn't go as, as a success story in the end, uh, uh, yeah, we, we cannot really reveal that, no one wants to reveal that. So. But usually we have an, a definition of what they're looking for. We can do it as a challenge. We can publish if they want. They want to do it undercover, stealth mode, no props, whatever they want. And then we do the scouting. And there's some basic requirements. And then you have a few pages on details that need to be filled. We go out and do the scouting. And then we uh, 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 scout from um, the input, do a short list, usually around 10, 5 to 15, but say 10 startups, can be global, but usually on a European level. And then we evaluate in detail, and then we introduce the ones that we think are most fit, and then or they can choose one or two or whatever, it depends. This is something we do in part of the service agreement with our corporates. We don't charge the startups. For startups, this is a way for them to get introduced, otherwise they have no chance, to be honest, to uh, be on the table or on the radar for those, uh, for those uh, big corporates. 
So this is Swiss startup, and here's one that's actually was scouted before I joined. They are from Sweden. They had a, a turnover less than 1 million euro, 10 employees. Julius Baer is probably one of the biggest wealth management players globally. And they had a challenge with sustainable finance, evaluating all the uh, bonds and funds and everything. So you need to have something that works in their systems. So all the, of the, all the startups we, we uh, channeled, evaluated, this one popped up. Good. So they all sign an agreement, let's work together. But then they have to go back, big corporate. So I think they have, I don't know, only a thousand employees. So it took almost a year before that was integrated, informed internally, and then they can start to real business after POC. So now the founder, Juan, is every month in Switzerland, working with US Bear. And by that, of course, uh, Switzerland is the paradise for wealth management players. They have other uh, clients on board. So. so he's super happy, even it took from start to doing real business more than two years. So he was pretty frustrated for you spare. They thought it was pretty fast process. Um, yeah, to boil down some key, key, key takeaways, you have to be face to face uh, between the corporate and the startup founders or the startup core team. We have to think about the mutual benefits. It doesn't always go um, uh, a success in terms of uh, let's say, launching this service or product, but you have the learning curve. Again, it's a core element. It's not always it becomes to a POC or pilot or service that the corporate integrate to their business, but the learning is massive. And for the uh, startup, it's also massive. Now I know how to work these really big corporates. If you don't have the experience being seen before, now I know so. And then, of course, long term. Uh, any corporate, it doesn't work weeks. Luckily, maybe months, but usually years from the starting point to, to the, um, uh, the successful POC or product that is, is um, launched on the market. I think that was this. Yes, actually, it was. Good. Was okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andres, uh, for giving this uh, global view of how, how corporates and startups interact in the different ways. Uh, but now I would like to focus on the local players and invite uh, Andres Batminas, the CEO of SuperHow. And I hope that you can show and tell us and the audience how you do things locally here in Lithuania. Or oh, maybe locally. I hope so as well. So uh, I try to be focused and short because we are out of the time. But yeah, the essence is to, to, to talk about SuperHow and our experience. So uh, yeah, a little bit about us. So I'm a CEO and co-founder. We are a five-year-old company. We are focusing on building innovations. So we provide research and development services for other companies. Uh, we are focused on uh, four major technologies. So we are a tech company. Uh, we don't do strategies or you know big documents. So we are focused on how to adopt technology to a business or a public sector level. So those technologies are distributed ledger or a blockchain technology, artificial intelligence, extended reality, and quantum computing. Uh, so those are the trends that Accenture in 2019 said that will be the most transformative technologies for the next five years. So that was the ignition time for us. You know, we were just established as a company and we decided actually to go for that. Uh, SuperHow is a fully uh, bootstrapped company. So we haven't had any external funding. Today we are more than 50 engineers that we have locally. Uh, we had lots of different projects and partnerships with different you know, institutional players, universities, uh, research labs, and etc. We try to balance you know, knowledge and curiosity. So when you're building innovation, uh, knowledge sometimes is not the key. So you sometimes have to unlearn what you already know. So you have to have a decent part of young talent who are curious to do things 
curious to do things in a different way than the old guys are saying that, you know, we have knowledge of doing so and there are boundaries what we cannot do. So that's pretty uh, important as well. We were awarded and we won several awards. So FinTech Innovator of the Year 2022, uh, Best Emerging Tech Innovation nomination and same year and many more. So we have proven track record of our expertise in the market. And yeah, so we work, majority of our clients are businesses, enterprise, as startups, scale-ups, but we also to just to make, you know, our world and lives more fun. We work with institutional and public sector as well. As for example, Bank of Lithuania, Bank of International Settlements, uh, Bank of England, and big corporates as Ripple. So uh, today we'll tell a little bit more about how to understand, you know, innovative needs of, of those of the public sector. So one of our first clients was actually Bank of Lithuania. Uh, and what is the driving points for Innovate at public sector? And I fully agree with Vilos, who said, you know, in the innovation field, this is the most, uh, how to say, hardcore case that you can take. So, you know, public sector, why they are innovating. So most of public sector institutions, they are pushed by expectations of citizens, how it is done, so in a, on a political level. So one of the, for example, pressure points is Next Generation Internet Initiative by European Commission, which is, you know, how to progress with Next Generation Internet, how to progress with innovation next 10 years. I don't, yeah, I don't say five years, it's like 10 years, long-term strategy, which basically uh, such regulations as MICA regulation, as DLT pilot regime, as data acts, as you know, digital single uh, act was born out of that uh, citizen pressure, which is, you know, through the elections, which is from, you know, we are serving the citizens and etc. So this is the most important one. So the next one is budgetary efficiency. So, and I think Lithuania was a good example. So uh, when we joined European Union, so there's was a big time for digital transformation, electronic services, digitization of, you know, processes and et cetera. It was not just because of, you know, make uh, people's lives easier, but make the budgetary planning, you know, the collecting of taxes and et cetera more efficient. So for example, electronic declaration system, which I was also working as a young specialist uh, almost 20 years ago, it was, Basically, not just for a benefit of the taxpayers, you know, to, but there was incentives actually how to, you know, how to push them to de declare the, the taxes, but basically to make that budgetary effort easier. Technological advancements. So uh, countries are also competitive. So uh, when some country has adopted, for example, central bank digital currency. Another one is also, uh, what is that? So why, why they're doing so? So I, I remember 2017, when it was just a topic on a very small group of central banks, but in 2019, every central bank was discussing actually central bank digital currency. And today we have lots of different projects, uh, initiatives, and all already working proof of, proof of concepts in the market. The fourth is crisis response and resilience. And that was very good shown during the COVID pandemia, when lots of public sector institutions were not ready, you know, for, uh, let's say, working from home, isolation, so lots of, you know, had to adopt it technologically to put, you know, meetings on the teams and et cetera and et cetera. So that was also a big push. And another thing is also, for example, defense sector, which is also pushed to innovate because of wars are happening, because the crises are happening. And 
the rules of war also changed because of technological advancement. So you have to adopt, you have to innovate. And that is a big push for public sector as well. Collaborative networks. So if you are, you know, the part of union, the part of something, the part of, for example, Bank of International Settlement or the part of European Central Bank. So you're pushed to innovate or to participate, to deliver, because you're not alone. You're, you know, you're influenced by other, not Lithuanian citizen, you know, uh, demands, but other countries who are pushing you and, 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 and making you to, to do things. So that are the key public sector innovation drivers. And let's speak about some of our experience, actually what we did and, and what, what was the, you know, the outcomes. I have selected three, uh, three different use cases or projects. Uh, they are different because of different processes, different level of innovation, different dynamics of the project. So first one, this is, you know, 2018-19 is the Bank of Lithuania Digital Collector Coin. So it's a pity where sometimes Lithuanians know about the project, but it's very well-known project abroad. Singapore, Japan, uh, Georgia, Sakartvelo as a country, they know Lithuania because of this project. And some of those countries are trying to follow the steps and to repeat the process by, you know, innovating in the field of uh, commemorative coins. So we were the team behind uh, the blockchain technology solution uh, of the project. So why it is interesting? So the project was uh, organized as a legal tender, as a public tender. So uh, how to describe the requirements, you know, in this to in order to buy that service? So it was quite challenging and. Uh, the process itself was very, like, you know, formal, organized, and innovation sometimes, not sometimes, but most of the time, it's sporadical because you, you, you don't know what you don't know. So in order to innovate, you need to know lots of things and you, lots of those things you are getting on the process. Uh, afterwards, uh, with the Bank of Lithuania, uh, we have participated in a next project, which is uh, DEX TF Project 2. So it is European Central Bank, Central Bank Digital, Digital Currency Experiment uh, Project, which was basically, we were a technical team behind the Bank of Lithuania. So with the knowledge that we had, the technical knowledge and expertise, we were participating together with uh, Bank of France, Bank of Spain, Bank of Italy, and the Objective was actually to prove the DLT or, or a blockchain suitability uh, for the uh, digital euro, the future digital euro. Uh, what was actually the challenge? Again, uh, public tender, uh, the process, and because of that, we were late, I think half a year late, because the project was already started, so French... Uh, Members of the of the counterparties of the project were already, you know, on the on the flow, and when we started the project, we had only three months to deliver. It has to be fully, you know, fully working prototype. So first of all, blockchain infrastructure integrated with Target Two infrastructure, different use cases proven and uh, report written, and we did that. So we proven that three months are pretty enough for agile and uh, well-adjusted team to deliver. Of course, what methods we used? Extreme programming. This is the only case when you can do that, when you don't know what you have to deliver and you have to adjust during the process, and that worked. Uh, the next project, which is a very fresh project, so we are launching that as a production uh, solution in, in one month. So why it is interesting? So it is a collaboration project. Collaboration project where several institutions like Coimbra University, Nova University, uh, Casa de Moeda, the, the oldest royal mint in the world of Portugal, and Ripple, 
were participating to repeat Lithuanian success of commemorative token, of commemorative coin, actually as a product. So what was the challenge to agree? Very different, you know, agendas, very different goals, the processes. Ripple was financing the project. Other, you know, participants didn't have any slack in the game financially. So they were dragging the feet, you know, because there is no intention to do something. But at the end of the game, we succeeded. So in one month, we are launching the fully production product. And we already have participants, clients, to use that platform for their own projects to issue digitized collectibles. And the final one, which was actually also last year, it was the idea just to participate. So phase two were fully paid. So we, get, we got our revenue, our income out of those first two projects. And this one we did for free. So this is Bank of International Settlements uh, Innovation Hub. So the Bank of England is leading that Project Rosalind uh, case. So it is also Central Bank Digital Currency Project, which was a text print. So how it was organized. So it, it was organized just as an invitation from the bank, you know, to participate, to submit use cases for the already established infrastructure. So there's like restful, you know, service ready to integrate and companies were invited to deliver use cases. And for delivery, we had only one month. So we had to deliver a fully working prototype, test it, prove it, show it, demonstrate, and uh, win the contest. So there was an incentive actually to participate was they selected three best use cases which were awarded and nominated in, the, in front of all the BIS members, the central banks. So we came up with five use cases actually. And at the end we came up that all those five use cases can be implemented in one application. And we developed the solution in two weeks. So because our team had a planned vacation time and <laughs> they, went, <laughs> they, they, they went for a vacation, so they had only two weeks to deliver a project. And we were selected among the three best solutions together with Accenture and one small company from England. Uh, so what are the challenges? I already discussed that and my colleagues also mentioned that. So all public sector organizations are focused on innovation success. Say so they want to innovate, they want that success. But most of them are very afraid of, you know, failure. And that failure or that, you know, being afraid of is born from other things like organizational culture, which is very important. So there is very less innovative culture in public sector. So you have to somehow ignite it. And I think having such, you know, I don't know, personas as Villas, as Marius Jurgilas, as, uh, you know, other, other guys who are doing that no matter what. You know, there was a political decision and political philosophy, political decision is very, very important for that support. You know, and most of, I was, I started actually my career in the public sector. I was responsible for electronic declaration system at um, like a tax inspectorate. And you know, being young and having lots of ideas, oh, let's do that, oh, let's do this. And I was always shut down, always shut down. Because, you know, being that, how to say, coming with ideas, this is not a culture of public sector. It is very traditional, very slow, very big organization that is afraid of many things. So risk appetite, this is another thing and innovation and risk, most of the cases it doesn't match. 
So you have to take risk in order to innovate. There is no like, oh, let's do that without a risk. And there's always a risk and the appetite for that risk is very important. So, you know, on a political scale, so the decision makers are putting their name, you know, on that. They are vouching on that. So they want to be sure that it will work, that it will succeed. But th those who work in research and development, they know that, you know, hypothesis or like saying that the hypothesis was wrong is also a big win. But in a public sector, it is not so. In the startups, we have even saying, you know, fail fast. So the failure is acceptable. But in the public sector, it is a disaster. So that is a big challenge. And of course, political philosophy, it's, it's like all over the place. Because, you know, everything is political. Even, you know, why to do so. So there is a, uh, that ambition of the person. So if, and if that ambition is low at the decision maker level, it is a disaster to work with something innovative at the public sector. So that was my topic. And for the last, I want just to leave you with that. So some, not sometimes, but it is a common that if you want to find something new, you have to forget what you already know. So that is the important part when you're actually doing things in an innovative way. And in a public sector, it's a big challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Andrews. Uh, listening, listening to all of you, I uh, had a... Um, idea that you probably read uh, most of my questions for the next uh, panel discussion because uh, the, the content that you showed uh, almost covered all the questions. Anyway, I would like you to join me uh, on this uh, stage uh, for, uh, for the next uh, panel discussion uh, with the name Navigating Towards Innovation, Avoiding Pitfalls and Route. We are a bit late with time, so we will try to squeeze in 30, 35, 40 minutes uh, maximum, right? Uh, Rasa, you will tell me when we should end. Uh, but just keep in mind that if you have any questions for our dear uh, uh, panel participants, please, I would encourage you to uh, catch them after uh, the discussion and ask uh, whatever you would like to ask. However, uh, while uh, listening to Vilus, uh, I thought about one idea. I would like to start uh, uh, this discussion not with a question, but uh, with a uh, with a um, question to the audience. Do you have any questions for the panelists? And I will see if that uh, works. If uh, the audience is ready to ask question after the presentations. So let's see what happens. Do we have any questions for any of the panelists? All right. Uh, at least I know you should not ask uh, the questions after the presentations and keep them for the end of the discussion. Anyway, so... Uh, uh, let's start. Uh, today I will be wearing the corporate hat, if you don't mind, uh, because uh, the, um, the theme of the, of the discussion is how to avoid pitfalls. And I think uh, uh, the corporates might uh, um, jump into a pitfall and, uh, and, and um, won't be successful. So uh, today I would like to start this uh, discussion with the, with the question, what are the key factors for corporations um, to ensure that any kind of programs, whether it is an accelerator or incubator or whatever, aligns with the, with the company's strategic goals uh, and corporate culture? So what, what are the key factors so that uh, the company does not fall into the situation or doesn't realize that uh, somehow, uh, you know, we're not in the right places or we shouldn't be? Here, 
Who wants to start? Make sure your mics are on. New for me. Um, I can start since we work with the startups all the time, with the corporates. I think the uh, understanding internally that is not always a straightforward and logic process. So, so meaning that there are going to be hiccups, there are going to be mistakes, there's going to be um, sometimes uh, bad mistakes. Uh, so they have an uh, understanding. That will be my uh, key uh, assumption. So the further away they are from the actual process in the interaction with the innovation or startup, the more difficult it gets because they want to see, as your presentation, they want to see the success, right? Not the learning. How do you measure learning interaction? Very difficult. So KPIs is very easy to measure revenue or success, but how do you measure learning? So I think that is, uh, for me, my key message. Andrews, I really liked uh, your slide with the with the iceberg. Uh, could you comment? You know, because I think the corporates really look at this top uh, small piece of the iceberg. But uh, you know, how how to really tell them that there is a huge chunk uh, beneath the water that they need to fix in terms of you know philosophy and culture and all those things. Yes. So uh, we have. We have experience working with big corps and uh, speaking with them and understanding the mindset. So basically, it is um, uh, it is very, like big corporations are very similar to public sector, not so conservative maybe because they're bigger push. Like uh, you know, they have to be profitable, so the profit, the hunger for profit works very well. While you know, governmental or public sector is not so pushed by you know money, just. Uh, and sometimes money is a problem to be profitable, even I would say. And uh, so in the corporates, there is this um, understanding, like, like the most success lies in being fast. So I saw a very good examples when if innovation is a little bit isolated uh, out of, uh, from the whole company, because why it is so, why it is good, because when we speak, Speaking with you know the company uh, people who are working on a daily basis, they have lots of problems, and they are so dig up in those problems. It is not even for them. There is no time to think about innovation or something different. So if the company, the big corporate, has a separate department which is only you know taking those problems and thinking isolated, you know, in an isolated way, how to do more innovative way or how to push that, how to change even the business model. This is the better way of moving, and this is more successful. But that has to come with a strategy. So the strategical you know, decision has to be made to do that because that costs money. That is an expensive thing. And not many corporates can do that to have innovation inside. So open innovations or you know, to go for startups, to work with uh, faster, better, knowing more, you know, more advanced companies works better in that way. But then I think uh, some intermediaries are needed because otherwise there's a big gap between, you know, smart, fast startup and the corporate because those want to, to, to move fast and the corporate is, you know, the processes, the things and etc. So the strategy has to be actually to spend a lot of money on doing internally or going for external innovation and both things work. Really, so would you like to touch the public sector? What are the key factors? Because you, you've done a lot of great things and really uh, the, the, the examples that you showed are really impressive. But what are the key factors so that they, this public sector culture really accepts uh, whatever great things you're trying to achieve? So I do not see a huge difference between... Uh, either a big company or a public service uh, institution because uh, so they have the same features, uh, clear functions, uh, cr credible outcomes, uh, low risk profile. So, and so those things are, are basically inherited and 
if you want to understand both sides, so innovative uh, small companies or startups, and if you think that you understand them, you're wrong. Uh, if you think that you understand the political philosophy and if you think that you understand the, um, what public value creation is, so if you um, do believe that you understand being on the other side, you're wrong. So this is why you need an intermediary who can help uh, um, build those bridges and in this respect, a continuous uh, partnership structures, they are indeed very helpful, where on almost on, on a daily basis you can share your ideas, you can check uh, what uh, um, the expectations are of your partner across the, the bridge, uh, or across the, the river, so, uh, and only uh, only with better understanding you can uh, create win-win situations. So it's not so easy to understand uh, in uh, the real life other people. Everything is great, as it was uh, said, is on the paper. But in, in reality, you, you need to invest in, into that. Thank you. Uh, it, was, it was mentioned uh, today that uh, the question now, it's not whether you should uh, innovate, but how you should do it, right? But still, uh, many corporates don't do it. Uh, don't do it for, 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 for various reasons. So could you maybe share from, from your experiences, what are the common misconceptions corporates uh, have about you know, different programs and how they could use different ways of uh, achieving innovations? Um, I would say you need to challenge yourself, the organization, and not, that's not always easy. Again, what are you measured about? I just want to bring up maybe one difference with the public to a corporate, uh, while it's more sensitive uh, public sector, it's public money. So in case it goes wrong, you have media, you have people really banging how you spend tax money. If a corporate is sensitive, but it's at least private money, um, and they, even you, you look at the big corporates, they have a massive turnover, and you think those products is, you know, tiny, 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 but they measure everything in atoms, really. So they question everything. So um, um, I think the ability to, to really challenge the organization uh, is a key in that sense. You can. Yes. And it's leadership. If you come, usually that's what you see. There comes a new management, a new CEO with a diff, slightly different agenda. Uh, it filters down, takes time. But you have to anchor that on top management. Uh, you cannot have it isolated somewhere. You, oh, we have an innovation lab in another somewhere. Many people don't really know what they really do. They do something, but uh, we don't know. If that's happened, I don't think it's the key to success. You need to challenge everywhere in the organization. If you talk about banks, I mean, I think most of you know banks, you're not getting paid to do uh, risk. <laughs> you're very risk aversive. Uh, the whole business model is not based, to, to as, uh, based on take as little risk as possible, really. So if you do something that touches that, then you really need to uh, have it anchored and uh, integrated in the organization. It's actually okay in this sense, in this uh, situation, to do mistakes because we learn. But then you have to be incentivized also for that. Thank you. Anybody wants to add? What misconceptions? Yeah, I think, uh, I think one of the misconceptions is, you know, and I saw a lot of it in, in, in the big business, uh, is uh, we're too big to fail. And uh, the competition, uh, like being ignorant to competition and small. So it's sometimes a big danger for big corporates and being, you know, reluctant to innovate. Because basically, if you're not following the trends, if you're not adopting the new technologies, uh, it is the matter of time when you will be, uh, you know, outcompeted from the product perspective. Of course, then you have, you know, opportunity to buy the company, to, go, to buy the competition. So there are like strategies how to work with that. But the question is, in that essence, is 
then you, you will have lots of different challenges, how to integrate, how to you know, adopt that new thing and a lot of things. So it is always better to be on a track and still do something in the innovation field, not to be reluctant and just you know, satisfied with what I already have. And in the most cases, those, this is the, the biggest danger actually, just ignoring things that are happening and that is a, an example with Tesla and all other car producers, you know, the ignorance. And now everyone is doing electric cars because of the trend, you know, they had to catch up. And most of them, they're using Tesla technologies. So in the essence, it's who, who, who won, you know. Uh, but there are lots of examples also in financial uh, industry. So for example, commercial banks and challenger banks, or you know what happened with open banking. So none of commercial banks, none of the big players wanted open banking because it was a competition for them. So, but there was a decision, you know, made uh, the, you know, pressure from citizens and innovation that, you know, I would say status quo, it was not good because none of the big, you know, I don't know, banks were innovating and creating something because it was good business. So why to, do, to innovate? Just, you know, sit on that and, and do money, what you already know. And open banking changed the rules. And we have fintechs, we have, you know, Revolut and other, you know, things and that had to change. And that this was decision from the policy, you know, to make change. So what I can say from my personal, personal experience, when you have uh, a big organization, either um, public or, or private, uh, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, usually, risk appetite is, is is very low for for obvious reasons, and uh, different methods of convincing are, are working. If uh, a company's risk appetite is is very low then uh, mm, you should, uh, how to say, you should dig, dig a hole that, look, if you're not going to do, if you're not going to innovate, so something wrong is going to happen. But if risk appetite is, is high, then you can say, look, you should paint a sun, draw a sun, look, if you innovate, you can create such a great thing. So it's a matter of, of risk appetite. And naturally, it is, it is very, um, it's, uh, very sensitive in, in, in public sector, for those reasons that you mentioned. But in general, there is no difference between public and private. Uh, your example with uh, if... I don't know, a small amount of money was misused in, in public or private. Uh, nowadays, with the uh, cancel culture, you can destroy, uh, destroy private company as well. With the same political philosophy, uh, which is used in public sector. For example, if uh, a small amount of money was spent misused uh, and uh, somebody bought something which is not green, yeah, you can destroy that company. Thank you. All right, so if I'm a corporate and you have convinced me uh, and I have solved my internal, cultural, philosophical, whatever issues I had, and I'm ready to go into a collaboration with, uh, you know, accelerator or whatever partner. Let's call it. Uh, could you share uh, if uh, there are or what are uh, some red flags or, or warning signs that could be, if 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 it's possible to uh, to spot them without, you know, doing and failing, doing and failing kind of method. Anything to advise a corporate, like a low-risk uh, corporate like myself? So the advice is for the corporate? Yes, for, my, for myself, yes. Uh, yeah, in, again, the number of people involved. I've been doing a lot of uh, sales in my uh, in business-to-business sales, pretty complex. 
five years sales process is super uh, complicated stuff. And the tendency is the more is more and more people involved in the purchasing process. So in these projects, you have to have a lot of people involved. So it's not just one person or two that are the front, that are the, let's say, the intersection connection with a startup. I think that's bound for failure. So because you need to anchor it, of course, as much as possible in the organization, but you have to have more people involved. A bank have four or five different business areas. Do they know about the project? Because if you do hear something on the investment banking, actually could have something interesting for the retail banking, vice versa. So that's one thing. You cannot have like one single point, even if you have a contact person or a small team, if they're not really anchored in internally, I mean really anchored, not the email, but really anchored in the process, um, that's our um, uh, experience. It usually doesn't work that well. Then you get into the risk of this innovation theater. Yes, we meet in 10 startups and we fiddle around a bit and uh, good to know them. That's it. That's it. Yes. Without yes, without any really, and it could be failures. And again, it, it, it's, it's okay. But then we have figured out that uh, and it's good for the bank or b b b good for the corporate. Anything to add? Any other red flags yeah, just, you would recommend? Me too. I just agree actually that you need to be prepared because uh, you need to be involved. And usually we saw actually several cases when uh, big companies, uh, they have a department of one or two people as innovation department. And uh, you know, those one, two people have to bring something innovative and it doesn't work because you know, it's, it's, it will never work. Another red flag is, you know, you need to, uh, to understand that it takes time. First of all, sometimes it takes time to adjust to a new technology. Sometimes it has, a, you know, to be open to uh, see a new business opportunities. So there are lots of corporates that are very focused on what they do good and do well. And they're sometimes missing the opportunities, what they could do actually by adopting new technology, what new business model it could create. And that is also a red flag of, you know, lack of being open to uh, adopt in a situation, see broader, you know, picture, how you can benefit out of it and change that perspective that you're currently working. I would even say that the current technologies, those five, those four technologies that I show sometimes, so it was a usual that uh, business is driving the technology and currently it is the opposite. The technology is driving business models. So it is like, uh, transforming 30, like 180% like in a different direction with decentralized data, you know, management uh, methods and everything. So you have to think differently and you have to be open for that to change. So from business philosophy point of view, uh, for example, how we uh, check if the client have potential problems no, we just ask a very simple question, who are you? And if you receive very different answers from the same company, it means that um, either the identity of the company is, is not sufficiently clear, or uh, they are just, uh, as, you, as you said, just emailing <laughs> to each other but not uh, an organization, a uh, united organization. So uh, the same test can be applied uh, when you have uh, uh, innovation team, either internal or external, and you should check if the identity of that big organization, uh, if a small team uh, sees itself as a part, integral, integral part of, of, of that, organization and of course with uh, our help <laughs> we can uh, find those answers it's not easy it's not obvious but uh, questions are usually uh, are very simple who are you and you check if the identity of that team uh, is very far or not so far from a, a bigger picture do you ask the question why 
Of course, it's uh, the most important question uh, in general. <laughs> you see, I remember from your presentation that is a very important question to ask. Thank you. All right, so we discussed uh, red flags, some things uh, to avoid, um, but usually, you know, the the corporates when they when they try things, when they do things, they like to measure things. Uh, so I know. Some of you probably have this uh, yeah, on your slides, but I would like to maybe just uh, briefly uh, touch upon the metrics and, 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 and what indicators do we believe are the most crucial when you know, working with the, with the large corporates. We uh, usually try to coincide number of iterations with startups. The pure number of products is one good KPI because it's not one. Maybe not hundreds, but uh, let's say uh, in tens should be a good measurement. And also the speed, not that we want to chase the speed uh, as such, but you can measure how long time from the first contact that we got the, the result, because that's actually token on how the organization is working with this project. There's two KPIs we uh, use. Uh, not so much on the end result, how much money the bank will earn after the project. It's actually their business, but um, uh, those are something we implement. And then we have other quality factors, stuff that we evaluate before we can actually uh, uh, connect the startup with the bank. But that's uh, it's a good, good sign if they want to have the numbers of projects. Uh, so it's not just one, and that one needs to be successful. Yeah, I fully agree with uh, my colleague, and maybe to add up how we measure the success is, you know, how much of those proof of concepts are live or production, you know. So that is one of the measurement that it was adopted fully into the, you know, uh, organization and it has a purpose of doing something meaningful. Uh, but I would also encourage, you know, the corporates to somehow still measure that knowledge, the gain of that, you know, or received knowledge during the process because that is also a very valuable, actually, thing. Not only successful projects, but uh, not successful. I and understanding why it doesn't succeed. You know where was the missing parts, or doing the recap on that. You know and understanding. You know getting better in that field, or getting more knowledge and adopting to the situation and progressing. So lots of corporates not doing that because it's very difficult to measure how much knowledge you gain. From my side, so the best KPIs are those uh, which were deeply discussed and agreed. So that's uh, that's the key. If uh, if just a big company uh, raised uh, expectations and put it in different figures, it doesn't mean anything. So uh, if you discussed in depth uh, KPIs because uh, if you are a startup, you also uh, so you want to uh, your dopamine system work. So it should be challenging. It it, it should motivate. Uh, you should see meaning. And uh, but of course you need to discuss between those parties and agree on them. So that that's the best uh, result. I fully agree with that. Time flies. Uh, we have uh, probably time for one or two more questions. And I encourage you to think about that one important question that you have today. We have very experienced uh, panelists today, so use this opportunity. All right, so we have, I'm, again, I'm, a, I'm wearing a corporate hat today, don't forget. So. We had, you know, a, a successful, we avoided all the bad things that could have happened and, you know, we measured, wow, the program or the collaboration is done. And then, you know, as it usually happens, some things, some changes in the corporate world complex and how to ensure that this, uh, this program or this, uh, you know, innovation sparked uh, collaboration did not just die after one time, but uh, continues, and that becomes part of uh, a corporate culture of a certain company. Any, any advices? 
Yeah, so you touched the point, so the culture. So it has to become a culture. It has to become a habit of the company, you know. Uh, the involvement of the, of, the, of, the, of the employees has to be incentivized and it has to be, a, you know, organical uh, matter of, uh, I would say, progressing and evolving as a company. So uh, if you succeed to achieve that, I would say it, it will live for long because it will be in the, in the DNA of the, of the company to innovate. And that is the key point, actually, because uh, from that iceberg that I showed, you know, that in a, in a public sector, that political support, you know, what is the problem in, in a public sector that it changes every four years. So it, it usually it's very difficult to have that, uh, you know, how to say, political decision progressing, but you can achieve that if you are, you know, making an effort to transform that public sector into something that is, you know, has that value of innovating at the core of the company culture, of the, you know, organizational culture. And no matter, you know, how the political decision will change, still the, you know, the minds will be striving to progress and to evolve. And that is also the, one of the keys, how to make that sustainable and, and long-term. I can just take uh, maybe some from, from, um, from um, some good samples in corporates, but uh, you want to take the spark into a log and it keeps fire or at least a uh, glow. But uh, there are good samples like IBM in Sweden, they have innovation studios, so they bring in startups regularly because they have something they contribute and in, in return they learn something. There are very uh, on the edge of frontier technology that can learn and maybe they can integrate it long, uh, along the way and then they support them. They want to do market introduction in Brazil. Yes, we have a team there so we can help you out. You, know, you need to have tech support for that specific topic. We can support you. So it's like um, a corporate sandbox. You have it in the regulatory space in FinTech. You have the regulators set up a sandbox you can try out. So you have the same philosophy in a corporate, we bring them in. I think BMW in uh, Germany do, does it really well. In Sweden, we have AstraZeneca, they have like a cafe environment. They can come in, they want to meet someone from if it's production or if it's research or whatever. Yes, we bring it in and you can have a session to learn how we work because you're, not, you're too small for us to uh, do business with anyway, but we have so much learning and knowledge that we can actually uh, provide to you to make you more yeah, more bigger potential for success. So that uh, philosophy I really like. Uh, there's someone doing openly, someone do it in, in undercover. We had Alfa Lava in Sweden do these diary processing machines. You can sit down with them. We have this solution, super. It's not for us, but we really like it. So how can we help? We have a massive amount of suppliers. Maybe we can utilize some of those networks or... Uh, any market you want to have interaction, yeah, we have a team more or less everywhere. So that type of uh, mindset, or again, culture, I think it's uh, really good. Not so often in the financial industry. Uh, you're doing a good job here. I think that's the way to do that, actually. So you can actually meet without that stress. Wow, now we have to talk business, deliveries, da-da-da. We just uh, uh, exchange information, ideas. Um, more of that. <laughs> Business is, is about uh, working people to people. So and uh, so, if you want to have a success story, so basically, you you should grow mutual trust. Without this, so always think long term, and never try to maximize your short term value. It doesn't work. Uh, anywhere in relationships and uh, uh, in in business and in public sector, so always think long term. All right, very very good. So culture, using available sandbox opportunities, and think long term. Do we have one brave uh, attendee who wants to ask a question? Yo, I'll get us. Thank you. Similar to the same what these guys are doing. 
So how, how would you get it paid off? Have you integrated somebody to your organization? You it's a question for me? Probably. Yes, okay. Uh, I think we're just at the beginning uh, of what uh, Anders is, is doing with uh, with Tenity. So, uh, but uh, it's it's a, it's a small step. Uh, we are constantly looking uh, for ways how Swedbank could use this amazing uh, place uh, rocket uh, for such uh, you know sandboxes or pilots or. So we are we're we're looking for ways how uh, Swedbank as a company could invite. Corporates, uh, you know, raise a challenge or or, or, or talk about a certain area, and then look for startups could who could actually uh, address the challenge or the topic that the corporates uh, talk about. Uh, no, not not not. I mean, uh, the, there are uh, there are partnerships uh, that uh, uh, Swedbank uh, has uh, formed with uh, with startups. So I can mention uh, Arbonix uh, from uh, from Estonia, E Agronom uh, also from Estonia. Uh, there is uh, uh, Hema from Sweden. So. There are examples, but I think uh, as, as the bank, as a low-risk uh, uh, bank, uh, we're facing many of the things that were mentioned uh, <laughs> in these slides. So I was just sitting there in the corner and nodding. I was like, oh, this is my world. You know, this is what I'm uh, facing on, on a daily basis, but not as just myself, but uh, uh, as the bank uh, um, in general. So yeah, I think uh, the bank is taking small steps, but uh, maybe those steps should be uh, uh, larger and uh, more more proactive. But that's a very good question. Maybe I can can throw a comment actually, which is also a a common problem with really big corporates that has a, a global presence or regional presence. It's like a Rome, you know. So everything happens in Rome. So everything happens in Sweden. And everything is else province, you know. And sometimes the innovation or ideas from the province are not, how to say, encouraged or accepted, because of there is a like in a public sector there is a like, like uh, how to say competition between different authorities inside of the big corp. So I I, I saw lots of you know happening uh, in the industry with big players like for example Nasdaq. So. Nothing is happening in Lithuania because you know everything is happening in U.S. And if you have any ideas, it is a very hard time to get there and you know do something. So they making decision, and you are just you know doing things. And this is a common thing. So I don't know. Maybe in Switzerland it's easier because lots of happening there. But how to you know encourage global uh, massive corps to do something in the provinces, not just, you know, something uh, very uh, society uh, initiatives, but more up to business, you know, initiatives. All right, any more questions? I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? Where's the beer? Yes, so if there are no uh, public questions, I really, first of all, I would really like to thank you uh, for coming uh, to uh, Rocket, where actually, you know, we meet and we share ideas, and this is the goal of this place. So uh, thank you very much for, for coming. I hope uh, the, uh, the content was useful. Uh, it was useful for me, and i really taking a lot of notes uh, from today's uh, discussion. So thank you for that, and I encourage you to stay for, uh, for some time and ask some of the questions you might have uh, personally to one of the uh, panel uh, members. So thank you very much for coming, and have a great uh, evening, everybody. <laughs>